Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Marcel Cosman. And I'm Hannah McGregor. And hey, Marcel, Mm -hmm. I've got an idea. Ooh, let's hear it. Since we're starting book four today, and book four is chock-a-block with hormones, I want you to tell me about something embarrassing that you've done. Well, hot dog, Hannah, have I got a story (laughs) for you. I literally just humiliated myself in an attempt to get some pizza two nights ago, and I will tell you all about it in the sorting chat. So we we ordered some pizza. We were watching a very important hockey game. It was game seven of the Montreal Canadiens, also known as the Habs, versus the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, Canada's most embarrassing team. The Leafs are absolutely the most embarrassing team, and liking the Leafs is the most <laughs> embarrassing thing that you can do because there is an iconic children's book about the horror of accidentally receiving a Leafs jersey when you want a Habs jersey. It's just, listen, I know we only have like seven Canadian listeners, but if any of you are Leafs fans, change your ways. (laughs) This is a deep dive into Canadian culture for all of our international fans. Okay, so we're watching game seven of this hockey game. Uh, It was epic. And we ordered pizza. And we are also in the process of getting ready to move, which means that stuff is just out of its normal place. And I had forgotten that we had carefully placed some floor mats over top of non-functional vents that no longer have grates over them. And I was very excited. I opened up the pizza boxes, realized I needed to go get a plate, and promptly, like, just stomped right down into an open space in my floor and went down like a World Cup soccer player. This like, isn't embarrassing. <laughs> it's terrifying. You are very pregnant. <laughs> so this is also adding to it, right? Because my sister-in-law Jillian was here and Trevor was here and Elliot was here and they were all like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was fine. But I was very embarrassed because the pregnant lady was so excited about getting pizza that she fell into a hole in the floor of her own home and then was just like dragging myself on hands and knees shouting, why? Why? How was the pizza though? Like, did the pizza survive the fall? The pizza was fine. The pizza was on the table the whole time. I didn't even sprain my ankle. I actually think it would have been less embarrassing if I had seriously injured myself. (laughs) Well, we wouldn't be telling this story as a a fun (laughs) opening to our podcast if you'd snapped your ankle as a result. Yeah. I think one of the possible takeaways for this is that things that feel deeply and acutely humiliating for us as individuals are not necessarily perceived as embarrassing. And isn't that divide between experience and outside perception theoretically fascinating? (laughs) I wish I could segue that into the topic of today's episode, but I cannot. I think it was a great effort and not at all embarrassing that you tried. (laughs) Thank you, Marcel. Well, since today's episode is all about structure, let's ensure that we have a solid foundation for our discussion. It's time for revision, the segment where we revisit what we've covered so far in preparation for moving forward. And that wasn't very funny. I know that. But you know what? Neither is structuralism. It really isn't. It's the absolutely the least funny theoretical framework <laughs> But we're going to spice it up with our signature style. Okay. All right. So the most significant episode to revisit here is 
for sure going to be our first episode where we talked about Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and the series as a whole as a hero's journey, which we contextualized in terms of Joseph Campbell's concept of the monomyth. Blah, 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 blah. A so-called singular cross-cultural transcendent narrative in which a hero leaves home to go on an adventure faces some sort of crisis, and returns home transformed. We also talked about how white men love to imagine that stories of white men are universal, and the problems of having a quote-unquote everyman hero who is far from every man, let alone every one. It's also worth returning to our conversation about metaphors and how they operate because, surprise, stories about tasks are very rarely literal. (laughs) So as we're tackling this fourth book in which our main three go to a dance and the most evil wizard to walk the earth is reborn and kills one of their peers, we might think about how the challenges faced by these 14-year-olds represents other stuff. We also pointed out when discussing Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone that we can see structures of the hero's journey playing out not only within that novel, but within the series as a whole. And we can also see versions of it playing out within each of the different novels. Mm. So the series is kind of like a series of micro journeys that assemble Voltron style to create one mega journey. Love it. And I thought, since this is our first discussion of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and so much happens in this book, that we might want to just run through the events. Particularly because these events, especially the three-task structure of this narrative, really invites us to think structurally about what's happening. I like it. Tell me more. Here's what I tried to do. I tried to go through and pull out what I thought were the major plot points to just give us a summary of what happens in this book. So we open up, the riddles are killed. Then Frank the Gardener overhears Voldemort and Wormtail, is killed. That segues into Harry waking up. Mm -hmm. That's more granular than I'm going to get for the rest of this summary. Harry strategically extracts himself from the Dursley's household, goes to the Quidditch World Cup. The Dark Mark appears. Harry, Hermione, and Ron travel to Hogwarts. Mad-Eye Moody appears at the opening feast. (gasps) Dumbledore announces the Triwizard Tournament. We get an introduction to Moody, turns Draco into a ferret, teaches the students about the unforgivable curses. The Beaubaton and Durmstrang delegations arrive. Then the Triwizard champions are chosen, and Harry, surprise, is chosen as the fourth champion. What? Yeah. That's when Rita Skeeter arrives along with Ollivander for the weighing of the wands. In preparation for the first task, Hagrid shows Harry the dragons. We start to get suspicious of Karkaroff, the head of Durmstrang, who we think might be a Death Eater. Hermione teaches Harry the summoning charm. Harry tips off Cedric about what's coming in the first task. And then we get the first task proper. They have to get an egg away from the dragons. Harry and Crumb tie. They all get clues about the second task, an egg that makes a screaming noise. Um, <laughs> Hermione starts spew. Go, Hermione. Yeah. Harry invites Cho to the Yule Ball and is rejected. Oh. Then the Yule Ball happens. Various events occur at the Yule Ball, including that Cedric tells Harry to bring his egg to the bath. Sexy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Harry solves the egg riddle. Someone breaks into Snape's office. Second task, rescuing somebody from the people in the lake. Harry ties with Cedric by trying to save everyone. Harry overhears Karkaroff showing Snape his dark mark. Harry meets up with Sirius. Hermione is harassed as a result of Rita Skeeter's article. Barty Crouch Sr. comes to Hogwarts under mysterious circumstances. Harry dreams about Voldemort and Wormtail. Harry looks in Dumbledore's pensive and sees these sort of past... Death Eater Trials, yeah. Past Death Eater Trials. They prepare for the third task. I know I'm moving quickly, but don't worry. There's a reason I'm doing this. <laughs> they prepare for the third task. The third task happens. Cedric and Harry decide to take the trophy together. It turns out to be a port key. They're transported to the Riddle family grave. 
Voldemort kills Cedric. Wormtail uses Harry's blood to restore Voldemort. The Death Eaters gather. The Priory Incantatum spell brings back the ghosts of the many people Voldemort has killed, giving Harry time to escape. Then he gets back. Moody tries to kill him. Dumbledore interrupts. We find out that Moody's actually Barty Crouch Jr. in disguise. Oh they give him Veritaserum. He's revealed... So much exposition follows. Fudge (laughs) arrives, refuses to believe that Voldemort has returned. Dumbledore and Fudge fall out. Dumbledore tells the school that Voldemort is back. Hermione reveals the truth about Rita Skeeter, and Harry gives George and Fred his winnings. What a whirlwind! So much plot. So here, Marcel, as I humorlessly barraged you with a series of events, I want to ask you, Mm -hmm. how did I decide what constituted an event in the plot of the book? So my first guess is that you copied and pasted the scene titles from the fourth movie. Huh? Huh? I wish. That would have taken way less time. (laughs) I didn't do that, but... I did do probably the same thing that the filmmakers did, which is just grab all of what felt like the significant plot points. What's a significant plot point? That's, I, you know what? That's a hard question that I'm not sure I really know how to answer. The scholar of literature in me would say that different events are going to be significant to different readers for different reasons. A hundred percent. Ooh, good. I love to get it right. And we have modeled that in our approach in this whole series Mm -hmm. to how we read, right? That we look at the books rather than looking at them chapter by chapter. We look at them lens by lens. And in each one, we pull out different moments, events, passages, kinds of language that we find significant when we look at things with a different frame. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what happens when the frame that we are looking at is the very question of plot or narrative structure? That is a lens that is inviting us to say, okay, so what happens in this book? And what order do those things happen in? And in the very process of asking ourselves what happens, we have to start to say, Well, what is the difference between plot and everything else? I didn't take this class in undergrad. I don't know what's (laughs) happening. (laughs) There's this story by Jorge Luis Borges, who is a Latin American writer really interested in sort of like messing with the very idea of representation. And in it, people are trying to create a perfectly accurate map that represents a a particular kingdom as accurately as possible. And eventually, in the attempt to make this representative map as accurate as possible, they end up creating a map that is exactly the same size as the kingdom itself and completely overlays the kingdom. And so the question (laughs) being asked in that story is, when we are invited to abstract key elements out of something, anything that we're trying to represent, what series of decisions do we make about what we're going to abstract? And how is it, if I was to pull out a series of key plot points in this novel, and you were also to pull them out, and 500 other people would also pull them out, there would probably be pretty significant overlap in what we consider to be the major plot points, despite the fact that this is a super long novel with a ton of stuff that happens in it. Okay, so the thing that I find really challenging about this approach is I'm so used to thinking about differences Mm. and the ways in which different readers will approach a text differently that the idea of thinking in terms of commonalities and similarities that are sort of inherent to the text itself feels very strange to me. 
Yeah. <laughs> it feels like a slippery slope into becoming a modern day Joseph Campbell. Blah, 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 blah. It does. If I start claiming that there are like things that we will all recognize as plot points versus things we will recognize as scene or character, that next thing we know, I'm going to be like, okay, but I have a new monomyth. Everybody <laughs> buckle up, which obviously neither of us want to do. But I think there are some really interesting things we can learn from thinking this way. So um, why don't we learn a little bit more about thinking this way? Okay, Marcel, I hope you're ready for some hard work because it's time for Transfiguration Class, the segment where we dive deep into a new approach to text. Okay. This sounds hard. (laughs) It is hard. I genuinely have a hard time wrapping my own head around structuralism. So we're just going to go through this together. We're going to begin with Vladimir Propp, who was a early 20th century Soviet folklorist who was really interested in structure, though, like Soviet critical theory is is particularly characterized often by a real interest in, in structures. And so he was interested in looking at Russian folk tales and figuring out if you could sort of like pull them apart and categorize the kinds of building blocks that made them up. Okay. And he argued that every folk tale could be broken down into 31 component pieces. They don't all have all 31. Okay. But all the components they have are in that list of 31. Wow. Okay. Okay. Right? So some maybe only have 15 of the 31 components, but the list of 31 is exhaustive, according to him. And the order is stable. So even if some stages are skipped, they still always occur in that order. Okay. Okay. And they all have names, um, and I'm absolutely not going to name all 31. You can look them up. One is actually called Transfiguration, which I thought was delightful. That is delightful. One is called The Difficult Task. (gasps) And according to Prop, it is a a fundamental building block of myths and fairy tales. Protagonist undertakes a difficult task. So we could definitely, as we did when talking about the hero's journey, just go through Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and point to the way the different components of this novel match up against the different structures Prop was interested in. But I actually think it's more interesting for our purposes to take a slight step back and think about that structuralist tradition in which Prop is not the sole significant figure. Okay. So the idea that Prop is working with here is that narrative consists of a set of consistent structures like language does. In order to make up a sentence, we've got a set of building blocks that we can put together, and we have shared grammars because that's how communication works. And so we're, you know, you and I are part of the same speech community. We speak the same language in the same dialect of that language, out of the same cultural context, with similar references and similar knowledges. So when you and I speak to each other, we are drawing on the same kind of repertoire to construct a sentence, but then layer onto that literal grammar the additional sets of cultural context, Mm -hmm. subtext, inside jokes, and we can see how, like, we have these whole repertoires that we draw on to make meaning in a sentence. And structuralists say the same is true of stories that there are these these building blocks that you can draw on and that you put them together to create more complex stories. And the complex ones might be made out of, like, a lot of building blocks, but they're all kind of the same pieces, more or less. Okay. And so so that's why we might recognize similar patterns in stories that are otherwise quite different? Yeah, absolutely. That's why we're able to look at a set of really different stories and say, oh, look, these are all coming-of-age stories. Oh. Or it's why we can recognize genre, right? Like, oh, these are all romances. I can tell because they all have the things that constitute a romance. 
But what's really important to understand about structuralism is that it's not just about the idea that you can break things down. It's about there being a relatively stable relationship between the parts and the whole. It's not just the idea that I could take any story and break it down into 31 component parts and name them. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that that act of breaking down and identifying pieces shows us that all of these different cultural stories have a structural relationship to each other, right? So it's not just like I can point to the moment that is the difficult task in this story and be like, look, this story has a difficult task. (laughs) That's interesting. (laughs) But it's about saying... Well, a difficult task plays a particular role and has particular resonances. It means something. Mm -hmm. Its capacity to mean something to us has to do not with just this isolated piece and its existence, but with how it relates back to the whole setting that it's in. Okay, so I I have a question that may sound sarcastic and it's really really not my question is why (laughs) (laughs) why does this why does this work why is this why do these sort of component pieces relate to one another and uh, why (laughs) I mean different people have different ideas of why And for a lot of structuralists, what we're doing is trying to understand a phenomenon that we already know exists, which is that we are able to develop shared meaning out of communication, out of language. And so really, they're asking how. When I say the sentence, I am going to walk to the store, Mm -hmm. how do you know that I am saying that's going to, that's a thing that I am planning to do in the future. Because of shared grammar? I mean, that's the question, right? Part of what's hard to wrap our heads around about structuralism is that it's so fundamental that it's hard to even imagine what the world would be like without it. Like learning about ideology, right? Like once we learn how ideology functions, the process of trying to think beyond ideology makes your head hurt. Yes, absolutely. And structuralism makes your head hurt because it's about trying to understand how you know things that are actually pretty fundamental to the whole idea of knowing things. Ah! (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So if everybody's head is hurting right now, absolutely, we're all on the same page. Okay, good, good. Basically... If we understand that there are structures to things like stories, shared structures that repeat over time, then we can see how they connect and how they differ. At its absolute simplest, structuralism is about observing patterns Mm -hmm. and thinking about how those recurring patterns relate back to the whole, the whole being communication. Best way I can think of really breaking this idea down is if we go right back to the word. So I'm going to give you just a soup song of (laughs) saucer, which is to say, I'm going to give everybody a tiny taste of structural linguist Ferdinando Saussure. But don't worry, only just the tiniest bit. So so Saussure came up with this idea that language consists of a thing called the signified and the signifier. Okay. And the example we are going to use is a tree. Oh, I remember this. Okay, keep going because I don't actually. So the signified is the actual thing. What I'm trying to refer to when I say the tree. Look at the tree. Yeah. The signifier is the word. I'm saying the word tree so that you know to look at the tree as opposed to the grass, the bush, the sky, the cloud, the dog, the fence. You know, tree. The word tree is arbitrary. Right. Okay. There's nothing tree-y or tree-like about 
the word tree, right? Is that? Yep, absolutely. It's just an arbitrary sound that through, you know, generations have just used to refer to the same thing. And it's different in different languages. So it is an arbitrary relationship, but it's a stable one. Okay. Okay. Because if I just made up a new noise to mean tree, every time I was talking about a tree, you would be like, what? (laughs) It would have no meaning for me. There would be no cultural, shared cultural reference. There would be nothing. So tree doesn't inherently mean tree. It just means tree because we all agreed it means tree. Okay. What that means is that language is always metaphorical because the symbol is the relationship between the signified and the signifier. It's a symbolic relationship. We've agreed this sound stands in for that thing. And that's like metaphor, right? You're substituting one thing to another thing to help people understand it better. That's just how language operates. Okay, so language is magical, is what you're saying. Yes, literally magical. We've got this symbolic relationship between the signifier, tree, and the signified, that thing out there. Okay. But that symbolic nature of the relationship between signified and signifier extends beyond just our ability to say this thing means that thing. Because symbols relate to each other in patterns. So we understand things like there are 500 different kinds of trees. And we know that tree doesn't just mean that tree, it means trees in general. This is actually a pretty difficult part of language acquisition for kids. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you explain the difference between a dog and a cat to a child? Because there's a lot of categorical similarities between those two animals. And we've got different signifiers for them. This is really Interesting, because right now, Elliot is super curious about poison ivy. I don't know where she learned about poison ivy, but she, like, is a bit worried about it. And so just the five-minute walk from our house to daycare is like, is that poison ivy? Is that poison ivy? And I tried to be helpful and say, you'll know it's poison ivy because it'll have three leaves. In my head, silly Marcel thinking, nothing else has three leaves. So now every time she sees a three, like, a bunch of three leaves together, she's like, is that poison ivy? (laughs) No. (laughs) So she's got the signifier, but she doesn't have a stable signified that it attaches to, and it's causing her anxiety as a result. That's right, because she's also heard that poison ivy means you'll get sick. Yeah. So she knows it's bad. She knows there's this word and it means something and it's bad, but she doesn't know what to attach it to. Exactly. And that is causing mental chaos. Yes. Yeah. Because it just grows. (laughs) And because she knows not only, so like she's got the signifier poison ivy, but it's attached to all of these other contexts, right? Mm -hmm. So it's attached to the context plant, and it's attached to the context dangerous, and it's attached to the context sick. So now her mind is trying to figure out how this structure operates. And so she's like, is that plant dangerous and will make me sick? Is that plant dangerous and will make me sick? Because she's trying to figure out what's the like, category, subcategory relationship here. Like, how do I arrange these new ideas in my brain such that I can navigate the world with this information? So the total arbitrariness of symbolic meaning alongside this need for us to have shared meaning so we can actually communicate with each other, this is like how language works, but it's also how narrative works. I'm with you. Okay. For example, if you try to tell somebody an embarrassing story, you are relying on a massive amount of shared understanding. That's right. Right? So structuralists believe that stories mean something. Here is a story, it means I was embarrassed. Because of a relatively stable or at least shared relationship between their structural components So there's signifiers, the language, but also the series of events and characters that took place within the story, and what those components are referring to, their signifieds, and between the many different symbolic functions 
within the narratives. So how those different signifieds relate to each other. So when you're telling a story about something that happened to you, there's maybe not a correct order, but there's like a, an ideal order in which that information will have the greatest impact in order to like convey what I'm trying to say to the listener. Yeah, right? We've got an idea that somebody is a good storyteller, but that understanding is very culturally specific. Ah, yes. Okay. So like the moth, that is like one really particular understanding of what good storytelling looks like that would be different in a different historical time, that would be different in a different linguistic community, in a different cultural context, in a different country, in a different class organization. Probably even in a different medium, right? Like in a it different may medium. not have the yes. same impact structure. It's structure. So this extra layer of meaning that symbols, this cultural layer of meaning that all of these symbols and structures have is what Roland Barthes, who is one of those guys who's like, is he a structuralist? Is he a post-structuralist? Hard to say. <laughs> he named this connotation. And this is something that like, if you have taken an undergrad, like, theory course, you've probably learned about denotation versus connotation. Denotation being the literal meaning of a word or a symbol. Connotation being its sort of larger cultural context. So he's particularly interested in how consumer culture mythologizes signifiers, mythologizes these symbols in order to add all of this extra layer of connotation onto it. So even though all wine is just fermented grapes somewhere in between grape juice and vinegar, some wine is good and some wine is bad, and that's not just about individual palate. Yeah, it's, it's the whole way that we read culture. Like... Good books and bad books? <laughs> No, like, have you ever gone into a space and immediately been stricken by class anxiety? Yes. Because <laughs> there's, like, too many forks, and you don't know what you're supposed to do with them. Because it's like, there's this connotation to things, like forks, which are just neutral objects, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing inherently classed about a fork. But the number of forks we have and the way that we relate to them has this, like, heavy connotative burden. Right. Such that one might become embarrassed through inappropriate interaction with a fork. On the face of it, that's absurd. Yes. That I would be embarrassed by fork. That is very silly. It is, yes. <laughs> it's possible because we not only have a noise, fork, that means tiny food stabber. Yes but also that we have layered centuries of connotative baggage onto fork, such that fork means <laughs> so many other things beyond mini rake I used to pick up carrot. And those connotations are not, I'm not sure if this is the right word to use here, but they're not innocent, right? No. No those connotations have weight for a deliberate purpose, right? Absolutely. What Bart is interested in is how they are these bourgeois cultural connotations that are about naturalizing or universalizing bourgeois cultural values. I don't want us to belabor this question of structuralism versus post-structuralism okay. because that shit gets real messy. <laughs> but I think, you know, one real distinction that Bart kind of leads us to, which is why he's cut that kind of liminal structuralist, post-structuralist figure, is between those who think that humans can observe and document objective facts about how systems work and those who think we are actively inventing those systems 
through the act of creating knowledge about the world. And if you will recall, there is a word for the idea that we generate knowledge through applying language to it, and that is discourse. Oh my god! We've come around! (laughs) So Foucault, who was our introduction to discourse, way, 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 way back, Mm -hmm. is a canonical post-structuralist. Okay. So Foucault is like, we take categories, we apply them to the world, in the process we create knowledge about the world that is not innocent knowledge. So if I'm understanding right, structuralism is like, hey, I don't make the rules, this is just how it works. And post-structuralism is like, you're actively reproducing the rules as you discuss them. Yes, exactly. So the monomyth, right? Joseph Campbell saying, I didn't make up the rules. I just noticed (laughs) that every story happens to operate like this. And then post-structuralists would come along and say, no, you generated that meaning through the activity of looking for it. Which is why I get in fights with physicists when they say time is real. (laughs) No, you're just making it real. (laughs) You just made it real by virtue of looking for it. So this all brings me back to this original question. How did I decide which events or structural components constituted plot points in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire? Okay, you took the components of the story that you recognized as being important, which is which comes from your education in literature and what your education has brought you to understand as being important, and then maybe also your education in literature that has complicated those things. And so that has also contributed to what is important. So there's like objective important, but also important to our shared understanding of the story. And then you wrote them out in a in a list. Uh, <laughs> and then maybe added added some for just to round it out to an even 33? <laughs> so hard. <laughs> I mean, it's not a riddle, right? Like, it's this process of I took the particular understanding of the relationship between parts and the whole, what constitutes a plot point in relation to the narrative as a whole, and I broke it down into what I believe to be component parts. And the reason I believe those to be component parts is a function of the way that I have learned to observe a thing called narrative as it is iterated over many, many, many different examples. So if Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire was the first story you had ever heard, you would have no idea how to identify a plot point in it. Right. It would just be so much information. Yeah. (laughs) So really what this leaves us with is a very important question, which is what, if anything, can structuralism help us to understand about this book? Wow. Okay. We have, we've done our reading and we've done a lot of learning. And I know I'm not ready, but hopefully some of you are ready for our final task. (gasps) Owls. The segment where we put our new knowledge to the test. So there are, by definition, a million things we could have talked about here, but I want to focus us back onto the narrative structure of tasks. Because tasks have this, like, readily available allegorical meaning. Hopefully at this point, people understand that tasks feel like they mean something for structuralist reasons. 
So, riddle me this, Marcel. What, if anything, do the three tasks in the Triwizard Tournament mean? All right, so listen. I did a lot of thinking about this before I actually learned what structuralism means. And so now I have no idea if what I think is right. (laughs) Whereas I was pretty confident that what I thought was right going into this. And now I'm like, I fuck, I don't know. (laughs) Well, here's, you know what? You know what I think will be a useful process? What? You tell me what you think they mean. And then we can talk about how you arrived at that interpretation. Because I think that's actually what structuralism does for us. Okay. We have more than three tasks in the book, but we have three named tasks. Yes. I've got dragons. (laughs) Or, more specifically, stealing an egg from a nesting mommy dragon. I have holding your breath, specifically rescuing children from mermaids. And then I have an amazing feat, finding the center of a maze in the dark, and then living to tell the tale. (laughs) So these are what I see as the three tasks. So if we go to the first one, as I'm thinking through this, I'm like, okay, so what does it mean to defeat a mommy dragon by stealing one of their eggs? Mm -hmm. What the book says is that, and I quote, the first task is designed to test your daring, blah, blah, blah. Courage in the face of the unknown is an important quality for a wizard, end quote. This to me is meaningless. This means nothing. This is just (laughs) like politicians speak for, we are putting children in a dangerous situation for fun and publicity, I guess. I don't know. It's like the Olympics. It It's a thing that we do, and it doesn't really mean what we say it means. Okay, this is the book where the kids become teens, like walking sacks of hormones, not a girl, not yet a woman, Britney Spears stuff. So I was thinking that it might be worth considering how these nesting dragons are both literally and figuratively mothers from whom the champions have to steal the keys to their success or the key to the next task, and also from whom they have to escape or leave the nest. I think I was thinking a lot about how, because both of Harry's parents are deceased, we don't really have the opportunity for an eatable story, but it is nevertheless a story of transitioning from like a child to a hormone-driven teen. And so their needs must still be some kind of escape from the nest, from the parent, from the mommy dragon. This is absolutely a structural reading. Absolutely. And the way that we know it's a structural reading is by the way that you went to the Oedipal. So you were thinking, here is this particular narrative structure that reoccurs through many different kinds of coming of age narratives. So the original Oedipus or Oedipus, I think it's pronounced both ways, story is basically this myth about a guy who accidentally kills his dad. He was abandoned as a child and so doesn't know who his parents are. Um, And so accidentally he murders his father and then marries his mother. And Freud took that myth and made this fundamentally structural argument Mm -hmm. that that myth was representative of, like, a shared cross-cultural, like, psychological impulse that humans have to murder their dads and fuck their moms. Yeah. As, like, a developmental stage. Yeah. (laughs) And so we could absolutely, we could respond to the presence of that recurring structure in many different ways, which is to say... You know, we could respond to it like we responded to Joseph Campbell's monomyth and make a post-structuralist reading, which is like, well, by virtue of going and looking for that as a universal trope, you will find it Mm -hmm. in many places. And that constructs a a certain understanding of the psychological by virtue of your seeking out that element. And at the same time, we can recognize that this is a structural piece of -of coming-of-age narratives that symbolically appears Mm -hmm. in many of these stories. And we can ask why. We can burrow down and say, is that because it is evoking 
a psychological truth because it is getting at something universal and shared about what it is to come of age? Or is it because it is intertextually referring to the many other examples Mm -hmm. of this kind of structural component being used in many other stories, such that as people who are part of the same speech community, you and I can recognize it and say like, oh, this is doing something more than its literal meaning. Right. This has symbolic and connotative meanings beyond the literal. And the reason why we might be able to not only find those, but find shared ones where we're both like coming of age involves a fraught relationship with one's mother. Mm -hmm. Structuralism is is trying to answer the question of how did we get that shared symbolic meaning? Right. And so like my looking at this task and reducing it to the component parts of like mommy dragon and escape, (laughs) that that's not necessarily the point of the task. That's like my reading of it is drawing on... It's drawing on your presence within a particular interpretive community. So an intertext, and in this this specific example, my willingness to associate Harry's escape from the mommy dragon with the Oedipal, or the myth of Oedipus Rex, that has nothing to do with, like, authorial intention. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not the author meant for this task to signify in that way. It's instead coming from me and my background, my education, my cultural upbringing, my interpretive community. Is that right? Did I do it? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yes. It is really important to note that that same structuralist theorist, Roland Barthes, who was like, Texts are deeply embedded in their interpretive communities and the many cultural connotations that are attached to things. He is the same person who wrote The Death of the Author. Ah, uh, yes. Very good. Because thinking structurally eliminates the intentional role of authorial control over a text, mm-hmm. right? It's no longer about saying, what did this author mean? It's about saying, how does this text mean? How does it mean? How does it mean? How does it communicate information to me? Mm -hmm. How do I interact with it? How is it that I am able to recognize the layering together of an intertextual allusion to classical myth with the literal events that are unfolding in the narrative. Like, how is that happening? It's about your relationship to the text and not a hyper-individualized relationship to the text, but your presence within your interpretive community, the text's presence within its sort of cultural context, and then how, you know, you and the text interact. Do you want to hear what I think about the next one? (laughs) I really do. So task number two, or as I like to think of it, holding your breath... This is the task where our champions have to rescue the most important people in their lives. In in need of rescue, we have a little sister, two new girlfriends, and a BFF. Mm -hmm. So here's what the egg says. We've taken what you'll sorely miss. An hour long, you'll have to look and to recover what we took. But past an hour, the prospect's black. Too late. It's gone. It won't come back. So the phrasing here is cruel (laughs) because it's really like (laughs) it really does sound like these kids are gonna die yeah yeah it's deliberately meant to provoke urgency but also maybe anxiety and terror in the champions both victor crumb and cedric diggory need to rescue their new girlfriends they are knights rescuing damsels in distress They've escaped their dragon mommies and now need to prove that they have the ability to provide (laughs) for their symbolic brides. But being in fourth year, Harry is not emotionally or hormonally there. He 
may have escaped his dragon mommy, but his favorite person is still his best friend and not is not even Cho. It's not even like the girl who he has a crush on. He's still like my friend Ron is the most important person to me. I mean, you know, fan fiction aside. So this moment reminds us that Harry is still a child, you know, mostly a girl, definitely not yet a woman. (laughs) And then I was thinking of this and I was like, oh my God, I think actually the fact that Fleur's little sister is the one who she has to rescue, I think that's a really interesting choice because... I would like to argue that it that it speaks to her maturity. I think that there are probably also some like shittier readings, but I'm refusing those right now. <laughs> I'm post structuralizing <laughs> right now, maybe. <laughs> you're fe- you're challenging structuralism with feminism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not Roger Davies under the water. Her like one time hookup after the Yule Ball, because Fleur <laughs> knows what a high school romance is and what a travel boyfriend is. And so the fact that it's her sister, I think, says more about, like, where she's at in terms of differentiating between fun, sexy times and, like, actual unconditional love for another person. And it may also be that she's the only champion with siblings, because as far as we know, none of the others do. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, like, they could have given Crumb or Diggory siblings, Mm -hmm. right? Like, that would have been doable. But I think, again, what you are seeing here is, like, you have argued for a structural relationship, for a symbolic relationship Mm -hmm. of this task to the rest of the narrative that is both structurally related to the task that preceded it Mm -hmm. and the task that follows it, right? So that is observing a sort of structural consistency across the narrative role of these three tasks, but that is also allegorically tied to other coming-of-age stories, to the the long history of quest narratives, Mm -hmm. to the notion of the knight errant who must go out and rescue a damsel in distress from some sort of monstrous other. And then you are noting how, like, the existence or subversion of that trope, so we see it following its expected form in Crumb and Diggory, and then not following its expected form in Harry and Fleur. And so then the presence of that aberration invites us to ask questions about it Mm -hmm. because we have noted and observed the structure. And so we can see where the structure is being shifted. I have a different reading of what's going on with Fleur. (laughs) But I think we're arriving at the need to read what's happening there for structural reasons because we have seen how that structure is being repeated or not repeated. My reading is that the scene is producing notions of coming of age that are fundamentally gendered. Ah. That are like, escape from the mommy, go get your bride. And that because they are so fundamentally based in this heterosexual and, and patriarchal notion of coming of age, that Fleur as a character is irreconcilable with those mm. structures. Mm-hmm. And so she can't be good at any of the tasks because she can't follow this coming of age path and like it would be much too like sexy a subversion to have Fleur go rescue a male romantic partner Mm -hmm. like that's not reconcilable with the kind of purity of a man rescuing a woman that's right and so she has to rescue a sister even rescuing her sister is like a turn to the domestic right she's like it's maternal it's domestic Fleur can't be the knight Fleur is the dragon Fleur can't be the protagonist. She's literally established as one of the monstrous others, right? That's right. She's a a Vila. She is a a shoehorned woman into a patriarchal narrative structure. All right, tell me about the third task. This is definitely my laziest reading of all time. (laughs) I want to argue that the third task... Finding the center of the maze and living to tell the tale is like not symbolic. In so funny because so many myths have mazes in them. <laughs> but it's like not symbolic in the ways that the other two are. Like the the individual aspects of the maze. They're not really symbolic. They're just like mini challenges. So we also know 
narratively that Harry has an easier time in the maze than the other ones because he's supposed to get to the port key, right? So I think because of the way that the maze is sort of set up for Harry to win, it doesn't really function as the task that it's supposed to. And so for us as readers, the real task is his escape from Voldemort because (laughs) because that's the thing he has to escape from. Yeah, I think that reading is really smart. I think the maze operates at a few levels because on the one level, it would fit really well as part of a series of coming of age tasks. Mm -hmm. So the maze, the maze evokes all of this, like the male hero's um, creative and intellectual overcoming of an obstacle that has been placed in his way by another older man. So like... The Riddle of the Sphinx is part part of the Oedipus myth, you know, that is linked to his murder of his father. We know that Theseus getting to the center of the labyrinth and defeating the Minotaur is in part about outsmarting the king who has set up that maze in the first place. It's like, okay, you've outrun the mommy, you've reclaimed the bride, now you symbolically kill the father, and Bob's your uncle. <gasps> Oh my god. And Voldemort's whole spell to be reborn in the kettle is about, like, taking from his father, who he has murdered. He literally, the book opens with Voldemort murdering his father. Oh my god. Right? And he's reborn at the end through taking the body part of his of his murdered father. Mm-hmm. And so it does structurally fit this sort of three-part coming-of-age allegorical narrative, but then it also anticipates our allegorical reading Mm -hmm. for the purposes of subverting it. The maze fits into the structure, and then so we think we know what's coming, so that then when you reach the center, which is supposed to be the moment of success, Mm -hmm. right? And we know that getting to the middle of a maze and reaching the goal is success for structural reasons because of the symbolic relationship between, like, mazes and narratives of completion. So we know that in that moment when they grab the trophy and it turns out to be a port key, that our narrative expectations have been upset. And you can upset narrative expectations because narrative expectations exist. Because of structure. Because of structure. My friend Bart asked me after reading this book to his child, he said, why didn't Moody just make, like, a book, a port key, and just hand it to Harry at one point? <laughs> Like, why doesn't he just on day one be like, oh, sorry, Harry, can you hold this cup for me for a second? Bye. (laughs) It would have been so easy. (laughs) Like, absolutely. He's like, it makes no sense. Like, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Because the meaning of this book is absolutely not literal. This book is wild allegorical nonsense. (laughs) Hot allegorical nonsense. Hot (laughs) allegorical nonsense. And hot (laughs) allegorical nonsense can only exist, can only make sense, can only be understood if we think about it structurally. Wow. We really went on a journey here. I'm so tired. I don't think I've ever sweated this much during an episode. (laughs) And I don't think it's entirely the heat. (laughs) thank you witches for joining us for episode 21 of witch please you can find the rest of our episodes by heading over to notsorryworks.com or ohwitchplease.ca or of course wherever podcasts are found if you want to hang out with us more we're on Twitter and often Instagram at Oh Witch Please. Witch Please is produced in partnership with Not Sorry and distributed by Acast. Special thanks to Not Sorry Productions for having us and for the whole production team for bringing these episodes together. We have a new permanent producer coming on soon and we're really excited to introduce them, but you're going to have to wait.
If you're into the podcast, why don't you let us know by dropping a review on Apple Podcasts. At the end of every episode, we'll shout out all of you who left us a five-star review. So you've got to review us if you want to hear me undergo the Sisyphean task of trying to say your usernames aloud. For example, thanks this fortnight to P.P. Clark 87 E. Fan- I think it's fantasy, but spelled in a cool way. KSKK91, Susan McG4, Elelia, maybe? Capital N, lowercase w, capital W, capital M, or maybe it's <laughs> Noom, and Chow Meandra? Yeah, something like that. You're all great, and you're very good at trolling me. If you want to hear even more from us, don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash witch please to check out exciting bonus content as well as our new prefix tier. Thanks to everyone who signed up for that. We had some enthusiastic uptake for the pins. On our next episode, we're continuing our discussion of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. But until then... Later, witches!